you've got no idea how exciting it is or, or what a thrill it is, especially if you, especially, I was fortunate. A lot of guys aren't. There's a lot of guys out there that, are, that sweat hard. A lot of guys that can't get the weight. A lot of guys that can't, it's not that they don't, probably, don't, and it shouldn't be unfair, it's not that they don't have the mindset to, they just physically are not strong enough to take off that amount of weight or, 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 or to see out a race meeting and take off that amount of weight. But I, I wouldn't change it for anything. Well, we're not going mad. We have had Garth Puller, ex-jockey, now trainer Garth Puller on our podcast in the box seat. Champion trainer in case it is. Thank you very much. We're getting to that. We're getting to that. But uh, he is our guest today and uh, we, we've called him back into this podcast to discuss more particular, particularly about dieting in jockeys and, and how to maintain weight because he's had to do that most of his life as a jockey. So that's the real reason why we've got Garth in. There's one or two other things that we'll elaborate with him as well. We've also got Max on the podcast, who's Garth's assistant, <laughs> his right-hand man, his wonderful burble that's uh, here at Summerfelt with us. And we'll talk a little bit more about Max later on. But it gives me great pleasure to welcome Hazelin's champion trainer, birthday boy of yesterday, Garth Puller to the podcast. How are you, Garth? Well, thank you. Well, yes, first of all, happy birthday for yesterday. What a lovely day to start, uh, way to start your birthday at the races, bang, in the winner's yeah. box. Oh, that was nice, winning the first one, eh? It could yeah. have been better, you know, about second, about three, t three races. Yeah. Uh. I, had, uh, <laughs> I had two thirds and then I had a very close second with, yeah. with a horse that doesn't know how to run a bad race, Q-Wing. Sure, I mean, I didn't race yesterday. I, um, believe it or not, ran a 10-kilometer marathon yesterday. I don't know if you can call 10 kilometers a marathon, but a 10-kilometer race, uh, the Hollywood Bets race at uh, King's Mead. So I, I was at home for the rest of the day, and Man down, uh, yeah. I, I, I was just relaxing mm. and uh, watching racing, and I, I fancied queuing, and I went back in the, in the form, and I saw the last time that queuing had won was over 1,200 with Tundi. I said, well, maybe 25 each way would, it wouldn't hurt, and that's exactly what I did, and it paid a six rand something for a place, but I would have loved the wins. Came from yeah. the clouds, good run. Very good. I just put him in just to remind him that he's a racehorse, but he's, uh, he doesn't know how to run a bad race, and yeah. if you... If you look at the form, the winner actually finished three lengths behind his Vungu Vungu level weights. So, you know, that, that makes it a, a terrific run yeah. for a horse that's won over 2,200. And, and his last two runs were 2,400. So. Yeah. Yeah. Just to go a little bit off the, off the, uh, the subject here, the, um, you two ran down the middle of the course. All the jocks are shifting to the inside. Yeah. I mean, that race split up into two. Yes. The outside horses won. I, you know, well, I, I just think the inside's taken a bit of a hammering. Uh, I mean, I don't want to yeah. put fingers at anybody. The inside's taken a hammering with everybody going that way. And uh, we did notice Peter, Peter Muscat actually came to me and said to me, he was upset with the, the track conditions, if we should move Wednesday to Gravel, which is very difficult to do, obviously. But yeah. um, because the jockeys all tend to go to the, the right-hand side of the track, yeah. it, 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 it was cutting up, yeah. and you're probably better off getting a run down the middle. Yeah. You know, I asked Antoine Marcus once uh, why he didn't stick to the outside. He said, well, if I do stick to the outside and I get beat, the trainer's not happy. So he said, I'd rather just go to the inside and, and take the punishment. <laughs> yeah, but someone like, Anton, someone like Anton should take it upon himself. I often went to the other side of the course by myself. Yeah. And, uh, and if you're proven wrong, you're proven wrong. But you, at, at least you had the... The at the guts, at, yeah, the force and the guts to go there and to, to you've got to work it out yourself. I would have, I would have said as a rider on a, on a day like yesterday that maybe I would have thought the ins, the, the middle was going to be yeah, better. Yeah. yeah, I remember Michael Roberts telling me about when he raced in Ireland once. Uh, he walked the track and he said, "Well, everybody's going the inside," but he walked the outside. He said, "That's the best going." Yeah. And him, he went on the outside and he said, with some old Irish jockey, he said to Jesus, he says, what are you doing here? It's only two of us know what's going on. They won by 20 miles and they yeah. actually inside and back here. Yeah, no, nothing, nothing much slips past Major Roberts, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, that was, uh, that, that, that's, that's interesting. But just going back to your birthday, uh, you know, as I said, uh, watching from home yesterday, I had to listen twice, Garth. I had to rewind the PVR because you said 72. My, oh my. We were just talking, Andrew, before you arrived. I mean, uh, I'm not being funny. I mean, it's just it's a simple thing. Andrew was telling me his age. He doesn't look his age. And you, for 72. I said to Andrew, I said, if you told me you were 
61 now, I'd believe it. How do you do it? How do you keep so fit no, and young? I, think, I mean, I think just keeping busy. Eh? Just keeping busy. I mean, I've, I've been fortunate. I've been healthy. I've, uh, I've never smoked and I've never had a drink in my life. But, um, but besides that, I think it's just been just just uh, keeping out of trouble and working hard. Yeah, 72, mm. unbelievable. I mean, yeah. really, it's it's you know, when people you think in the 70s, you think, oh, that old bully, eh? But uh, by no yeah, means well, old bully. slimmer. That's why we're absolutely, here. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. I, I can re I can remember thinking also when the guys got to like. Uh, in the racing got to 15, 55, I, I used to say to myself, well, they're over the hill. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, if you get there and it's just like, it, it actually is just a number. And, um, and if you're doing something that you enjoy doing, it makes it so much easier. Yeah, I mean, if, if everyone got up in the morning to go to work because they wanted to go to work, not because they had to go to work, it makes a big difference. Yeah, yeah absolutely. There was a, there was a buddy in, in, in England I saw in the Sporting Post there. With, he was 81 and he was riding in some race. You know, some amateur race I saw. Yes, that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Well, Stanley Amos, he rode till he was... He rode for a long time, long time yeah. yeah, he certainly did. Now, the reason, as I said, the main reason why we've got you here is in your... We know how it all started for you, we know all your achievements, etc. But one of our other guests a couple of weeks ago mentioned, you know, about dieting uh, and maintaining weight. And uh, um, Michelle Wing is currently doing a um, study on, on jockeys and, and the stresses and traumas that they go through, etc., which I must tell you is being very well received. So well done to Michelle and, and the England uh, company that's working with her, the England University. But tell us a bit about, you know, what did you, you know, how often did you have to diet? You, you speak about the, the brown rice and stewed apples and all the other things, because it's not just eating brown rice and stewed apples. Just, I, I, I know I'm throwing it sort of wide open to you, but yeah, tell us about dieting in, in, in the life of a jockey. But you know, you know, obviously I dieted to get into the academy. I was heavy. I was like 20 pounds heavier than all the guys on my year. So I, I stamped blankets in a hot bath. I caught a train. I never ate for three days. I, I lost like seven and a half pounds before I got to Natal. Sorry, that, sorry to interrupt you. You said stamp blankets? In a hot bath. I never knew about sweating. Okay. I, they, because I was taller and uh, I ran every, I got permission to run every big break and every PT period at school. For six months they would weigh me once a month in Cape Town at the jockey club. <laughs> and measure your bone and weigh you and of course nothing was changing. And they dragged it on and dragged it on. And now I got to mid-year and uh, I saw the, the, the advert of the, uh, of the academy and that. And my mother wanted me to finish my trick and I was in my trick. And I said, if, if you keep me till the end, I'm not going to get in. And Paddy Crowley was a stipe, and uh, his wife ran uh, the Cape Hunt Racing. And, and he bought horses from the man that taught me to ride. Sent, wrote a letter of recommendation saying, give this kid a chance, he can ride. Um, and that's what got me into the academy, basically. I tried to keep my weight down for six months, they measured me. Eventually they said, okay, send me to Durban. I never ate for three days on the Orange Express. I, I was dizzy when I got to Peter Marsberg Station. An army guy in the, in, the, in the train bought me, he bought me a Chelsea bun and a lemonade. That's all I had after three days. I arrived at the station, Mr. Dolt picked me up, one of the stewards of the jockey club, and took me to the academy. He asked me if I want breakfast. I said, no, I had breakfast. I had to lie. The meeting was in the afternoon. I went to the meeting, and all Paddy Crowley said to me was, I was soft-spoken at the time, but I was tough. I used to box, I, was, I played rugby. I was. All he said to me was, be cheeky. And there's no way in the world when you walk into a room with all these senior gentlemen sitting around the table and you walk in with a riding master that you've only just met that you can be cheeky. Yeah. Your knees are shaking, you don't know what to say. And, um, and afterwards I realized why, because if they thought I was going to be a bit soft and I was already overweight, they wouldn't take me. And I, um, I went through the interview, they sent me outside and half an hour later they sat for a long time. Cyril Buckham came out, he said, I've got good news for your son and bad news. The good news is if you keep your weight down, you, you'll be in. But if your weight goes up in the next six months, they're going to send you home. Sure. Well, Cyril was a pretty hard taskmaster. Eh? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, cut a long story short, I go, to, I go to the academy and I'm doing fine. I've ridden before, so they give me the, one of the more experienced horses that used to fly jump and I managed to handle that and things are going well. And it's our first weekend off and I go for the weekend with one of the, one of the guys, the Natal boys. Come back on the train to, to Pinetown Station, they pick us up, they take us to Marion Hill Academy, the old academy. 
and it's weighing. I say, what's that? They say, no, they're going to check everybody's weight. I, I ran and hid under the snooker table in the <laughs> snooker room, in the library. And I heard him upstairs say, is that new kid Puller, is he, was he on the train? They said, yes. They said, we'll go find him. Where's he? So they found me. <laughs> I got on that scale, I was shaking. It was those old scales that you move the weights up yeah, and down. Yeah, yeah. And he, he put it on the weight that I'd come. It went straight up. He moved it to 90, it went straight up. He went, I'm talking about in pounds, I say, he went to 91, it went up. Went to 92, it went up. Went to 92 and a half, it stabilized a little bit. He looked at me, I looked at him, but now, but now I'm shaking. He, I said, uh, Mr. Buckham, uh, this is my normal weight from Cape Town. He said to me, son, when you came here, your eyes were on the back of your head. And I was a jockey for 20 years, so I know that. Make sure you keep it there. So he saved me. He could have sent me home right there. Uh, but because he was an ex-rider, he knew exactly. And that was the start of when you're talking about dieting. That was the start. So I learned the hard way. And through my career, 41 years in the saddle, I also learned that no quick fix diet works. No quick fix. It had to be a lifestyle. Your body, your body's, your body will retain whatever it can straight after a diet. If you go without carbohydrates, it'll, it'll grab onto the carbohydrates once you're off. So if you take off, if you diet off a crash diet and you diet off five pounds, once you're off that diet, you'll, you'll, go, you'll pick up six pounds. Your body will always get a little bit extra waiting for the next, and especially in a jockey's life, which happens to be diets all the time. So it, it, it becomes very difficult. You soon learn that, you soon learn that the, the way to go about it is to basically eat properly, small amounts, but eat properly. Cut out the fat stuff, which is very difficult. Obviously, you have a good day at races, you want to go out and have a nice steak, and you want to have yeah. chips. And so, so we all went through all these kind of things, but Monday you'd be quickly back onto eating properly and trying to, ret and trying to retain it there. It's not a, And you learn to drink a lot of water. I mean, a lot of the guys did mad things. I mean, they outlaw elastics now, but the guys would sweat, myself included, sweat hard and have maybe still one or two pounds to take off at the end and they would take elastic. I never ever took more than, more than one, but it's, it's, uh, it makes you pass it's water. It's yeah, yeah. yeah. And it makes you pass water and you feel terrible. Um, you, you, you actually feel the weakness in your legs when you urinate. And, um, and that's like short-term dehydration and the minute you, your light rides past, you rehydrate. So I taught myself very quickly to dehydrate as close to races in other words, not the day before. Go light the two days before, have a boiled egg, two provitas, two cups of tea, um, and that would be for the day. And the next day the same. And then, then hit it off on a Saturday morning with sweat clothes on, three pairs of pajamas, plastic suits, track suits, go for a run if it's a hot day, or get on an exercise bicycle in a, in a room with heaters in, cycle until you're sweating. Your body becomes so accustomed to it that the minute you pick up a cup of tea and you put it to your lips, half a cup of hot tea, the sweat starts to run down your face. Jeez. And, uh, and I was a really good sweater, but it, my, unfortunately for me, my sweat never weighed much because I was a natural sweater. So I would sweat off three cups. The jockey next to me would sweat off three quarters of a cup. He would take off a pound, I would take off three quarters of a pound, which is frustrating. Yeah, they always used to measure with a, with a yeah. cup, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, you, you, you put it in ice. Yeah. Yeah. What do you I call it? Fill, you sort of, you, 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 sort you put of, soap on yourself, you lard yourself, and you just, you do, you, 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 you wipe yourself. Wipe yourself wipe, off, wipe it off, yeah, yeah. You collect it, so, and okay. then you pour it from the jug. I would, the guys will tell you, I would sweat off a, a, a kitchen jug, litre and a half, nine para, para, uh, polystyrene cups in one sweat. And then still maybe you have to put plastics on and lie down for an hour under blankets. So your body gets, you just get dedication. Get, where you are. I mean, Garth has only spoken for a couple of minutes, and I mean that's the that's we could end that we're not, but we could end the podcast now. And that's the, the he's, he's, he, he, mission accomplished because the, that's the message we want to get to the public out there. No, I mean, tough. Garth, it's, it's, it's sure. let me tell you, wow. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked. It's a way of life. I was very competitive. I, my boss used to say to me, Garth, you champion jockey, put your weight up three pounds. But luckily, I was educated enough and I knew that if I put it up three pounds, in two months I'd be taking off the same amount of weight to ride those three pounds heavier. And obviously it would limit the rides because I was riding as light as I could. Um, and then, I mean, the July ride came along, which was history. I, I, there's no way I was going to make it. We just had equine flu. I was walking around 58 and a half kilos stripped. 
uh, and, two, and it, it was two months before the July, and they wanted Michael to ride it. Michael had never ridden a July winner, and I just won the Daily News on the horse, and I phoned Michael. They asked me to phone Michael, and uh, Michael, unfortunately, well, fortunately for him, was riding Matoto and the King George and Queen Elizabeth, and he couldn't come. So Bert said to me, but God, you ride it. Ride it three pounds overweight. And to ride it three pounds overweight, I would have still had to take off 20 pounds. And I said, Uncle Bert, I'll, I'll do my best. I said, and I, and, I, and I know myself, I'm that competitive that I will get it all off. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't let the stewards weigh me. I just told them straight. They wanted to publish my weight because it was, I said, no. No one's, uh, I'm not publishing any weight. I went to the staff to ask them. I said, no, no, I don't have to tell them what my weight is at all. And I went on, obviously I went on uh, uh, brown rice and shoot apples and a cup of coffee and a grapefruit. And, but the, the big thing with, with, with all of that, the, the main thing was exercise. I played two guys squash, about nine games of squash. I ran from uh, Brickell Road to Umschlange and back every morning. Uh, not with straight clothes on, just in normal, just running. Normal, yeah, yeah. I would eat a huge plate of food, <laughs> huge. I mean, it was I was, just, I was to cook it myself. It turned it around to eat it, which was hot. And then, and it's the only time in my life that I really slept well. But to get back to the diet part, none of those diets work. And the, the best, the best way to retain your weight or to maintain your weight is eat properly, eat properly. not big meals, and exercise. That's yeah. the biggest point of, of anything. Yeah, but Bert, Bert uh, Abercrombie, I mean, he was a, a top boy in his, in his time. He was a top jockey. So he knew exactly what you were going through. Yeah. Oh, no, he knew. No, no, that's why he... No, he was quite happy for me to ride overweight. Yeah. Because I was the only one that had ridden horse and I'd won eight in a row on him. And... Um, but it was 59. Uh, 40, 49 and 49, a half. 49. 49. Straight. Yeah, Bush Telegraph. In yeah. fact, I, I, after I'd sweated the morning of... Stuart Randolph was my kit boy. And... Everyone was like sitting around watching because everyone was, no one thought I was going to make it. <laughs> and I, the night before, an Indian friend of mine, very good friend of mine, Ahmed Musa, he was manager of the Holiday Inns um, when I used to stay there. I said to him, just bring me, bring me a nice grilled fish, please. That's all I want. Sure. And he bought for himself and for, and for myself from the Holiday Inns, covered up hot. And he put it down, and I wasn't even thinking. And I thought, gee, it was two pieces of fish and some small boiled potatoes, and I ate the lot. <laughs> I didn't even think of him, I forgot. I didn't even think. And it was hungry. I, as I hungry was, I ate it. I went down to the vending machine downstairs. I got out two chocolates. I ate that as well. And I went to bed. And the next morning, I got up, huh? sent my stuff to Gravel, and I ran from the bottom of West Street to Gravel. Just a slow run. And I got in the box and I asked, oh, such an easy sweater, I used to sit on the floor because a lot of jockeys like it hot and I, well, I'm a natural sweater, I just sat on the floor. Had my tea and instead of going in with my jug, I went in with a jam tin. And I, put, I sat on a crate on the floor, I put a jam tin down and I said to myself, I hadn't got on a scale yet. I said, I'm going to sweat until I feel I've had enough, I'm going to get out. And you I still don't know your weight at this stage. No, no. I sweated three quarters of the jam tin. I said, OK, that's enough for me. Got out, put a plastic suit on. Full, full zip-up uh, woman's slimming suit, but no pajamas or anything underneath. I just put that on and three, uh, two track suits and I got under the blankets. And of course, with the plastic against your body and your heart, you keep sweating. And um, I still said to Stuart, I said, bring me something to put my feet in when I get, take my feet off the bed because the plastic is full of sweat. And I took my feet off the bed and it all ran out the bottom and um, got up. And you can see the guys were like thinking and I thought, I'll keep them waiting. <laughs> I went and I'll never forget I went and had a shave while you're hot you can have a nice close shave when you're sweating hey. I had a shave and I then went and had a shower I got on the scale and I had a I honestly had to look twice because I got on the scale I needed to be to ride 49 I would I would have got away with um, 47.8 those days we never had the, the we never had the um, safety vest and everything so I would, have needed, I would have needed to give myself two and a half, two and a half pounds. We never had the light. They got, today they've got super light saddles. And, but I, I'd made myself, I'd made myself uh, or had made material boots which weighed nothing. Just black material. Yeah. And, I, and I took the inner running sole of a running shoe and I put it inside for, for my foot to, in the stirrup iron. And so I worked all that out with, with elastic band to hold the boot up. And I got on the skull and I looked and I needed to be like, Basically, 
basically 47.8 or something to make it. And I was 46.3. And I called Stuart, I said, I said Stuart, go upstairs, boy. Give me a cup of hot tea, a glass again, and a Chelsea bun. Now. Now we can. <laughs> and I had that before. And I had four or five rides on the day, so I know all about the dieting, I know all about the wasting. But sure. what worked for me was rehydrating as close to the ride and I mean, dehydrating as close to the ride and rehydrating during the day. During the day. So I'd sip, I'd sip something after I weighed out. I know riding the race will take off what I've sipped. So I'll get back on the scale the same weight and then I'll have something, uh, have something more to drink. So I'd, I'd, I would keep my kidneys flushed all the time and touch wood, I've never had kidney stones or I've never had any. I problem. remember that race, that July. I, was, I remember I was the telegraph too. Yeah, but I was there. Groth, you looked like death warmed up. Yeah, I was white, white. She was white. whiter. Like a, like I, I wasn't there, but I remember, my, I remember the, after the race card, the year after. I remember what, what you knew with, with, with Stuart Ramsey, and uh, I said to him, Jesus, God, look, you're going to fall off at you the start. Was, no, you know what it was? You know what it was? I, I played those two guys squash. I, I'd run to him and back, not slow. Okay, I can remember, you asked talking Norval, you know talking Norval? You asked yeah, yeah, yeah. talking Norval. He ran in when he was in the army. He wanted to run with me. He sat on the pavement and waited for me. That's how, <laughs> that's how far. He sat after a couple of kilometers on the pavement and waited for me to come back. Jeez, to yeah. So, so uh, I was fit. And, and when you say pale, I, I was pale. I mean, if I stood in the mirror, I could see all the veins in my body. I could see all the veins. It was yeah. just flat and I could see every vein. But at the same time, I always think of one athlete that I looked up to and admired all the time. You think of one athlete that, that looked like death warmed up and was probably one of the best athletes in South Africa ever. Come on. Athlete. Athlete. Bruce oh. Fordyce. I was, I was, oh, yeah. I was oh, not oh, confident yeah. enough to say Bruce Fordyce. that you're going to say Fordyce. no, you silly yeah. idiot. Bruce Fordyce was as white as can be. Yeah. And, and he, he tapped him on the shoulder going up poly shorts and he was on his bicycle. Yeah, and, and he was good at it. And do you know, you mentioned that... Uh, um, Candice was at the airport the other day. Who sat was at the table next door to her? Bruce Fordyce. She says, looking younger than ever. The looking legend. younger he than ever. He was a machine. Legend, yeah. He was a machine. And he drank a lot of beer, so I'm all right. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember, I remember that, and, and the, fact that, the fact that I was thin uh, uh, didn't worry me. I, one of the guys said to me on the train, said, but God, you got uh, unbeaten horse in the July, and you, and you got five, four rounds before the July. Are you mad? And Peter Canema overheard him. He said, hey, that's my jockey. He rides for me. I rode two winners before the July. I rode, I rode a horse that wouldn't pull up, Tregalian. Can you remember? Yeah. He wouldn't pull up. He, he was one of those horses. He won, a short, he won a short hill and he, when he went past the post, he used to want to keep, keep going. going. Yeah, I had to stand up and turn him into the fence <laughs> to stop him. Because I didn't want to waste too much energy. Yeah, but yeah. yeah that's a, so when you, and you know what, you know what it is with racing and how a lot of the guys make it. It's adrenaline. No matter how bad you're feeling, just see a jockey that's really feeling bad and he rides a winner. Changes he like picks that. up straight yeah, away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can remember riding sledgehammer, taking off a hell of a lot of weight. Not for sledgehammer, for a horse on the day. And what I'd done is I'd made the mistake of sweating too close to the first race. So I hadn't given myself time to cool down and I was feeling terrible. I'd weighed out for, sle for sledgehammer. I got in the skull and I walked to, the, I walked to, the, to where Fred Rickby was standing to put my saddle down at Kenworth. And I couldn't see it. That's how dizzy I was. Dizzy, yeah. And I walked into the rail like that, and Frederick we was standing there, and I put my saddle down, nicely so I didn't overbalance, and I walked back. And my best buddy was Patrick McGiven. And I said to Patrick, I'm going in the toilets. When the bell rings for us to go out, just, just come in and ask me if I can see. And if I tell you I can't, let them change. And I sat on the toilet floor with my head over the bowl. And it, it, the floor was cold and the bowl was cold and I sat there. I, I couldn't get sick because I had nothing in me. And when he came in, I, I felt right. I got up and I rode. Thank God it was sledgehammer. But sledgehammer did everything. I just yeah, steered him. I, I just moved him out. <laughs> and he won. It was the Queen's Plate or the Somerset Wait for Age. I won one Queen's Plate on him and two Somerset Wait for Age. So it, was, it was one of the races. But I had three rides after that and I was 100%. 100%. 100%. just that, that adrenaline comes through in you. But you know, all, everything that's come through with, with interviewing Garth now is it's dedication. Yeah, yeah. Um, determination, and determination, dedication, and mind. Well, and and mind. Yeah. well that's yeah. what I was going to say to you, and, and, and putting Bush Telegraph aside, because that yeah. was when I remembered, so that's when I started getting interested in racing, was when Bush Telegraph was around. 
But what did you do to keep your mind sound? Because now you're lying under a blanket, hot blanket, heat is on, sweating. It can't be comfortable. It can't no, be enjoyable. No, you didn't have Netflix either. Yeah, what did you do? I mean, no, how did you, you keep yourself strong and sane? You just, you know what it is? It's a competitiveness. It's, 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 it's basically everything. Your work ethic, your, your mindset, your, your, your drive. It's, it's, it, it, really, it really boils down to how strong you are upstairs. Because the human body is very strong. I've seen guys fall. I've seen guys fall and take bad falls and get up. And so the body is very strong. It's what goes through here yeah. that keeps you there. You can have a fall, feel the pain and say, well, that's enough for me. I'm getting out of here. You can have a fall, feel the pain and say, I've got to get back. I've got to do it again. I saw Michael Roberts one day, horse duck for a shadow and he fell and they... As he bounced the horse behind him, I just missed him and the horse behind him, hit him in the ribs and I thought to myself dead. I pulled my horse up and I galloped back to him and I jumped off and he was blue. He was blue in the face, he obviously couldn't breathe. And there was Milton and they, they ran inside to get oxygen, they had those old canisters, yeah. they couldn't, they, 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 they ran out to him and they, now they're trying to force it over his face and open it and there's nothing coming out and he's fighting because he can't breathe and they put in this thing, the whole thing his face, there's no, worse, yeah. no oxygen coming out. Anyway. But he was, after that, uh, I think he cracked a few ribs, but after that he was back. I mean, it was just, that's a tough, tough yell. When the horses hit him, I thought he was broken in half. Jeez. Yeah. Garth, um, any regrets of doing all that? You look back now. No way, I'll do it all over again. No <laughs> problem. You've got no idea, you've got no idea how exciting it is or, or what a thrill it is, especially if you, especially, I was fortunate. A lot of guys aren't. There's a lot of guys out there that, are, that sweat hard. A lot of guys that can't get the weight. A lot of guys that can't, it's not that they don't, probably, and it shouldn't be unfair, it's not that they don't have the mindset to, they just physically are not strong enough to take off that amount of weight or, 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 or to see out a race meeting and take off that amount of weight. But I'd, I wouldn't change it for anything. Uh, you've got heavyweight riders out there that, that, uh, that battle to, to maintain their weight. You've got Bernard and you've got a, you've got a lot of them. Um, but it's just your competitiveness and your, and I never wanted to, I never wanted to get off. I've broken bones I've never got off. I broke my leg, I never got off. I broke my wrist, I never got off. I, I just made them make something that I could ride. I just wanted to, I, didn't, I, I knew the next guy would win on my horse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the same as people say, so-and-so is champion jockey. Does that make him the best rider? No. Definitely not. Does it make him a good rider? He's obviously a good rider, he's a champion rider. But he's the guy that's wasting the least, taking off the least amount of weight that can move all over the place and it's got the majority of the rides because He's, he's lightish. Light weight, yeah, sure. He's a light rider. It doesn't mean that the, the Bernard Fader Herb or the uh, Patrick McGibbon or the Kenny Michelle or the Patrick Crea weren't better. Mm. They were probably better horsemen and better riders and stronger, but yeah. they don't have the they don't have the, uh, the, the the availability of all those rides. Yeah. So it's just it's just I knew that if I took off, mm. the next guy the next guy's going to win on my horse anyway. Up, yeah. But yeah. you and PK went. We were a different division. Clayda. Yeah. Yeah. Clayda. Clayda's on next. Uh, we just to let you know. Yeah. Clayda's going to be on our podcast. I thought we must get her on. She'll have a few stories to tell us, I'm She's sure. She's got a lot of stories. <laughs> <laughs> but, God, do you get... Sorry, I was... Did you finish? No, two? Peter Canova. I mean, they, but the, the two of you were legends. I think the longest relationship between a jockey and a trainer. 23 years. Sure. Never got jocked off a horse ever. If you were his biggest owner and you said you want to try somebody else, he'll tell you... In your face, and I sat in the bus and read, I'm quite happy with the way the kid rides horses. Get your horses out of my stable by 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. Wow. <laughs> so, oh yeah. no, that's and I mean 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. Failing 8 o'clock, I'll open the doors and let them run down the main road. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, then you can, and then you can start to say, but p cry. No, it's just a suggestion. You say, I made my mind up. I started without you, I'll finish without you. Yeah. Jeez, I've never, you've never met a person that loyal in your life. Never gave me an instruction in my life to how to ride. Sure. Once we went through a bad spell, and he just said to me, he said, go out, slap their, slap their backsides and put them in the race. Because uh, I was used to come from behind. Come and, yeah. Just get clear for one second. We're talking to the legend, Garth Puller, about the days of riding and dieting and what a story he's telling us. It's unbelievable. I mean, yeah. that dieting takes such management. Yeah. I mean, and it's dedication. 
when you're dying for something to eat or a yeah. glass of water even and you, you can't, can't have, have it. it. Yeah. 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 No. But okay. anyway, lovely to see you as always and we'll see you on our podcast in the next week or two. Lovely, I look forward to that. Spot on, Clodagh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah so he's, he never ever gave me instructions and that one time he said, just slap their bums and get them in the race. And after three, after three of them, I placed them second, third, second, third, second, third, all ran out the back door. He came back in the jockey room and said, hey, ride your own races, don't listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's, the, that's the man he was. Never, I, I wish I was like him, never got upset at races, because it didn't make any difference. He'd say, my boy, the money's there. Yeah. You can't change the results. Get ready for the next race. Mm -hmm. So no good me coming and making excuses. So I learned to ride the way I rode, because my only instruction was, I went to ride his work, and he only had five broken down horses, and he said, I was with Herbie Lasker, remember Herbie? And he said to me, he was training on a little farm out there at, at Kalani Racetrack, and he said to me, son, for me, don't run wide. That's all I ask. And the first three or four hours, I got caught wide, everyone. <laughs> and then I came back in, I said, um, he said, my boy, get ready for the next race. You can't change that result. So you yeah. go inside and you're now panicking, now I'm drawn five, and how am I going to beat the draw? Okay, this time I'm going to jump and go, and I jump and go, and the two horses chase with me on the inside. And I can't get over, now I try and pull back, and the others are fooled in you. Yeah. <laughs> So then I thought, yeah. so I, what I then did was I learned if they looked like there was pace on the main side, I'd miss the jump by half a length, neck, and shoot in on the rail and shoot up on the rail behind them, hoping they would keep their position. And if they hold their position like I thought they would, I would be okay and I'd be in a good, I'd be in a good enough position. But often I'd do that and the guys in front w wouldn't hold their position or their instructions changed and they pulled back. Now I pull out. Now they pull me back in the race. Now I'm three quarter way back. So then I learned, I've made my one mistake. Don't make another mistake and try and pull out and go around them. Which the other guys also realize the pace is slow. They start to pull out. And as they pull out, you can move up, move up, and you can turn for them close enough to, to challenge. So, yeah. yeah, I was just very fortunate. Sure. But uh, they used to call Garth the head waiter in Cape Town. Right? Yeah. He always used to arrive. Why, why is that? But, yeah, because he used to arrive at the last second. You could strike a state of the striker got his name because he used to strike with him. Strike, right, okay. Goth was different division. <laughs> I, can, I can remember the headlines when Pierre started in... I mean, I got Pierre the ride when he ran second in the July. That was his start. And he, he, he spoke to me and he said to me, uh, but she was going to go back to PE. And I said, rather be, a, rather be a small fish in a big pond in Joburg than a big fish in a small pond. You, you won't grow in PE mm, mm, and mm. become one of the greatest riders of the country. Jeez. And I can remember the headlines. He went to Joburg and he got beat. I got the headline somewhere. He, he was getting beat, coming from the back and not getting up, coming from the back and not getting up. And um, I said, don't change anything. And the headline read, does, does Pierre Stratum think he's the golf puller of the Transvaal? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it wasn't long after that Pierre Stratum was, was the man. Yeah. 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 It must be almost, as you say, adrenaline. You know, you talk about things like adrenaline. Yes, it's not good on your nerves, but to be able, it must be exciting to ride like that, to know that you've got to time it, you, boom, to the last yeah, second. It's, it's your adrenaline under, pumping. The big thing is you've got to know what's underneath you. Yeah. That's 100%. Correct, yeah. That's 100%. Do and you our, get, sorry, carry on. No, our, horses were, our horses were trained like a, uh, Peter Kahneman was a big feeder. And when you're a big feeder and horses are carrying a little bit more weight, they don't want to blow from the beginning. If you, like you said, you ran a 10K, I used to run. Um, and I enjoyed running long distance. And I can remember doing t time trials right outside my house. And I thought I, was, uh, I thought I was good. And I arrived there and they had all these guys, my next door neighbor was good, and they were running eight kilometer time trial, two kilometer laps, and the woman would take your name and call your times out. And they were in groups, and I never knew what the groups were for, so my neighbor was in the back group, so I joined the back group, not knowing that was the elite athletes. And they set us off and set us off and set us off. And, and I went with them. Oh, and I was cruising for the first lap, cruising. The second lap, I started to feel it. The third lap, they dropped me like a hot potato. I came in the worst time ever. And I, so I said to myself, but I can't be, I'm fit. I, I, I run to take off weight, I'm light. I, I made all kinds of excuses. I said, no, 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 I know what's wrong. The time trial is on a Monday, and I've sweated hard on a, on a Saturday. My electrolytes are obviously not right. It wasn't the electrolytes, boy. I was just going off too fast. Yeah. And that, because I only found out the next week, no, these are the 28-minute guys for 8Ks. These are the 30-minute guys. Those are the 32, those are the 34, those are the 36s. So I jumped in with the 34s. Yeah. And after three laps, I dropped the 34s. And I ran a much faster time than, 
than I did with the, with, with the Foscars. Yeah. And then you fit your place, you realize, then you promote yourself to the 32 minutes. And I've, at one time I was running like a 29 minute 8Ks. Yeah. 29 and a half minutes, so that was pretty good. Yeah, you didn't have to go to the army, or you do. You had a mile and a half, you had to do it in 12, otherwise you never got bloody leave. Yeah. yeah. Um, Garth, <laughs> there's just a couple of things, but uh, I'm going to ask you, we, we just get through them quickly because obviously you guys yeah. have got a meeting and, 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 and we need to vacate the premises. So just a couple of things, there, but I want to cover them quickly if I can. No do, you get, do, you, do you get jockeys to this day that come and ask you for advice about weight, etc.? Yeah, often. Often, eh? Yeah, they, often. they come. Okay. Um, um, Gavin, good. Pins Gavin Pinzel came to me after my July diet where he was riding more, more hill, was it? Yeah. Mole Hill and he had, to, he had to diet and he came to ask me how he got it done and he got it done and he won the race for Sid Led. But, but you often do the, yeah, I, often I, it's I good, help the kids. It's good that they, that they tap on this font of knowledge. Uh, uh, Kevin Shea used to tell me he used to diet, maybe not as much, nowhere near as much as you, but now well, the point I'm making is to this day he's still a very small eater. I've yeah. been out with him and he's a small eater. Do you find that you're still a small eater or can you, can no, you no, let I yourself you enjoy your child? You can see I eat now. Okay, good. Okay, so that's good. And then the other thing is uh, we, I picked up and Andrew was also picked up at the races, often with your jockeys that come back with, they've won. Um, and I like to listen, and, and Andrew does too. Sometimes you, you, you're giving feedback to the jockey before you've even led the horse in, and, and you, you, you sort of down the line to the point, and yeah, I, I find that you're a no-nonsense guy because that's about discipline. It's, you know, you may ask, why did yeah. you do that, and you, why did you do that? Or no, I've given them a crack behind the ear in the jockey room uh, for winning by three and a half minutes, but, but not listening to my instructions. Okay. Ride the way I want you to ride. Okay. Because I've been there, I've done it. Yes, yes. And if it's my mistake, it's my mistake. Sure. I'll take it. I, if you go against what I've told you, then then I have, and I own a lot of horses myself, then I, or I might have the owner say to me, but I thought but you said they're going to sit, sit the horse in behind and it's gone to the front and go beat a short it. So it's, it's, I, I think you learn all the time. Yes. I mean, yes. I've been in this game a long time and I'm learning. I don't know anything. I can learn from one of the grooms, something that he found out that I never even thought of. So you learn all the time. But I. I'll tell them straight when I'm leading yes, them in. Yeah, yeah, that wasn't a good ride. Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it's, I, 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 and, I, and I'm not care. making it a point to criticise. Yeah. I think it's a good thing. That's no, no, what I'm I saying. don't. I'm not. I, I, and I tell them. I tell them straight. If I'm if I'm screaming and shouting, it's because I care. Yes. If I shut up, then pack your bags and go. Yeah, because I, I'm not interested in helping you <laughs> yeah, because absolutely. you're just not interested in yeah, listening yeah, to me. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's and, and we're all so, human. We all make mistakes. Correct. And it's also it's it's happened. It's it's it's. I think it's right because you know as you say. Yes, you, you don't go on and on. You, you, you give the feedback and say, look, why, why did you go out? Ask the question because it's fresh in the, in the, in the rider's mind. So, you know, that's the, it's the right. So, yeah, yeah, well, the thing is not to, hold, fascinating. not to hold grudges. So if the jockey did make a mess and you tell him, that's fine. Uh, but as you say, if he keeps quiet. Yeah, then you, then you know. Yeah. And, 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 and you also got to understand, well, most of those that you're talking about are the inexperienced guys that mm, are... Yeah. Mm trying to learn or on the up or Correct. want to learn. And I'm sure they appreciate your feedback. I'm not going to walk in the parade ring uh, to Anthony Del Pesh or to Anton Marcus or to one of the top boys and tell them how to ride a horse. No. I, if they haven't ridden horse with me or haven't worked horse, I will tell them their characteristics of the horse. Yeah. Sure. This horse, be careful he likes to be covered up or be careful he might take a tug sure, when you sure. jump or watch him going down to the start. He, he, because I believe if a horse is controlled going down to the start, He'll come out the pins and he'll be controlled. Yeah. If horse gets away with the jockey going out to the start, you often find when they come out the pins, their heads in the air and they're on their bicycles. So, but the, you don't have to tell any of the top guys. They just got to know the source comes from behind, and they know that because you also basically don't have to tell them anything because they would have studied the form, they would have seen the horse, they would even today they've got the we never had it today they've got access to replays, to replays and, and watching and watch watching, all those watching the horses last five runs. Mm, mm. I often walk in the parade and they tell me, <laughs> and they tell me this will there's two fast horses in the race on the inside, one and one on the outside. I'll, I'll, I'll get in the box seat. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah. they've done the work for me. You yeah. don't have to. Them. You see the box seat, eh? Well, this is the box seat. <laughs> Three more things quickly. Um, you never called for a ride in your life? When I was a jockey, I never, I was fortunate enough that I didn't really have to. I rode for a big stable, mm. but I never really had, had to. I rode a lot of work. Right. And I would, my biggest problem was having too, too many rides. Yeah, no, yeah, dupli <laughs> du duplications. But no, I was very lucky. Um, and that's why I say uh, I never chased the championship. Um, it wasn't, uh, it's nice to have it behind you. I won the South African Championship the one year, but uh, Michael was in England. 
But um, I run second to Michael a few times, quite a few times, and I won the Cape Championship for a good many times. But it was basically because I rode for big stables and I was fortunate enough to, to do well. Okay. okay. Any horse at the race course that gets loose, that needs assistance, you're the first one there. Because whether it's your comp well, or mostly your competitors' horses, whoever, you don't know who owns it, but you've always got the horse's interest, no matter where, which yard it comes from, at heart. If, I think if you, if it's part of your life and it's part of your living and you've grown up with horses and you can see the horrific accidents that do happen, I think it's in the interest of most people to try and prevent something like that. I do the same at the track. Track, yeah. yeah. I, I hate to see a horse running loose at, at, at 65 kilometers an hour when you've got all these horses ringing around like you see there and crashing into a horse or going through a rail. I've seen rails go through a horse's chest and come out their ribs. Um, I've seen horrific accidents. So you try and do your best to catch them. It's not, uh, you're not trying to be a hero, just try and help. Yeah, yeah, and well, got, it's, it's and well I'm fortunate received. enough to have grown up with horses from a kid. Yeah. So I've got enough experience to know when it's dangerous, when it's not dangerous, what it looks like it's dangerous. The saddle slipped under its stomach, don't get in the way of that horse, it's not going to stop, or whatever the case is. And I've always got a lead pony with me. If I can go catch horses, then I'll jump on the lead pony and I'll go catch them. But it's, uh, it's not nice to see horses loose, even on a racetrack. Yeah. You, you, you've got the whole public there and you'd hate to see us run through the rails or, or something. Yeah, but I think I've told you the story at Clearwood once, there was an appy. Uh, the horse went mongadoo in the, in the parade ring. Uh, Garth was set, I heard him shouting, let him, let his head loose, leave his head, leave his head. Mm. And the bloke actually listened and dropped his hands and the horse <laughs> relaxed. Paul Lafferty, Paul Lafferty's arrived. That's the funny noise you're hearing yeah, in the yeah. background. Horses often, <laughs> horses often panic through the hands of the rider. Yes. And anything you try and restrain, <laughs> anything you try and restrain or hold by force, you're oh, not going to win with, with the horse. You. The more relaxed you are, the more the horse will relax underneath you. So the horse has got himself up tight and you're trying to physically hold him. Well, three, three big men can't hold the wrestles. Yeah, yeah. Well, we um, appreciate that. That's why I brought that up. So thank you on behalf of the entire racing fraternity because you're always there to assist uh, uh, when in need. Sit. Then, to congratulate you for the championship. You've spoken about that. Well done, KZN thank champion you. trainer again. We're all very proud of you. Um, and then this chap at the table here, I'm going to close off about Max. He is, he's just the most beautiful dog and uh, you're an animal lover of all sorts. Oh yeah, I got cats, dogs. I, when I grew up, I grew up in a, in a poor family, one road above, the first road above Clear Race Course, semi-detached house. And I, you know, when you're a kid, you think it's a mansion. You know, when <laughs> I went back to look at it, it could fit in my swimming pool. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, uh, we had guinea pigs and rabbits, and we had to look after them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go cat, pick thistles and blackjacks, and it wasn't going to buy food at the pet shop. Yeah. You fed all your animals and you picked the food, the grass and whatever. Our times have changed. Yeah. But Garth, it's been wonderful to sit with you and, and to hear your story. Thank you. Pleasure. And uh, yeah, lovely. And, and just long may the winners keep coming. I know you've got some very good owners behind you and good results and uh, just a friend of horse racing and a friend of all of ours. So thank you and, and uh, all the best to you and your family and Wendy and of course Big Max and your whole string. Thank Thanks you very much. Yeah, yeah. lovely. The, the, the kids are not into racing, but uh, they, f they obviously follow what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. No, thanks, Garth. Lovely. Thank That's you. a wrap then from us. That's Garth Puller, KZN's champion trainer, but uh, we'd like to uh, give as much information out to you as possible. Him and Max from the entire production team, we wish you all the very best as Andrew uh, uh, gingerly strokes Max, but he's a wonderful dog. Thanks from all of us. Punt well, uh, be safe, be nice, and we'll see you as always in the number one box. Thank you for watching this week's episode of In the Box Seat Podcast right until the very end. We hope that you enjoyed it because we certainly did. If you missed last week's podcast, In the Box Seat Podcast with Andrew and myself, please go and watch it here. And uh, last week's uh, episode will be right there for you to go and enjoy and watch as uh, we know you will certainly enjoy In the Box Seat Podcast from last week.